Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiecka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiecka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiecka. Hello, dear friends, and welcome back to Mission Evolution Radio Show, where we share the latest information and leading-edge thoughts to support the path to unity and enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring pain-free as a key to evolution. Pain. When it comes to interfering with our ability to evolve, it's a real pain. Pain puts us in fight or flight, which is a low-frequency expression coming from the primitive part of the brain. When one's in fight or flight, we're trying not to die and not overly concerned with spiritual evolution. We tend to treat pain with pain medications, and they can be a blessing in the short term. However, everything expresses according to frequency. Drugs alter frequency in order to do their job. Pain medications not only put a ceiling on our frequency, but they also desensitize us. Evolution involves processing through the patterns, beliefs, and damage that restrict our expression. When desensitized, we don't access or process these issues, blocking evolution. Long-term chronic pain, medicated or not, can stop evolution in its tracks. It would appear chronic pain puts us between a rock and a hard place. Unmedicated, we're in the low frequency of fight or flight. And medicated, we're unable to process in order to evolve. How can we move beyond this deadlock? Is there a third option? With us this hour to help us better understand pain and alternative approaches to treatment is Dr. David Hanscom, author of Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. Dr. Hanscom is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in the surgical correction of complex spinal problems. He works for Swedish neuroscience specialist at the Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. He developed DOC, Direct Your Own Care Project a framework that organizes care for chronic spinal pain based on his own struggle with chronic pain and recent neuroscience research. He's working with Swedish Hospital to improve access to structured, non-operative care. His website, backincontrol.com. Dr. Hanscom, thanks so much for joining us on Mission Evolution. Thank you, Gwilda. I always enjoy talking to you. Yeah, it's always fun. Yeah, we always come up with some new stuff. Yep. Yeah. So apparently there's more to pain than meets the eye. Please tell us about the neuropsychological basis of chronic pain. Well, first of all, pain is necessary. We know that pain is simply a sensation that protects us from danger. And what happens is that, for instance, there's a small group of people that are born without pain fibers called congenital absence of pain. And their average lifespan is only about 10 years old. <clears throat> they can't protect themselves. They put their hand in the fire etc. And we also know in diabetes and leprosy, for instance, that you lose sensation of your limbs. What happens, people get very deformed extremities because they can't protect themselves. And when they've done research to try to reproduce the pain system, they can't do it. So when they have people wear protective garments to signal to the brain that something's painful, what happens is that the participants simply take off the garment. They just cannot connect to the environment. So unless you have that sensory input to protect you, you can't survive. So it's, yeah, a really that, critical part of the, it's a really critical part of the brain. That lack of sensory input would also separate us from everything else, wouldn't it? Right. Oh, that sounds painful. <laughs> right. But, yeah. but it's all, remember, it's all sensations. You know, you, your visual input, you don't stare at bright lights, and you avoid dark places because you can't protect yourself there either. So same thing with sounds. Your, your sounds are too loud, signals danger, so you avoid loud sounds. So every sensation has a part of producing this uncomfortable sensation that we cause pain. So for instance, on the skin, you have hot and cold, sharp, dull, et cetera. So they're just recept they're just sensors. In other words, there's nothing inherent in the skin that says this is painful or not. So your brain actually has to interpret the signals and say, yeah, this is dangerous, it's unpleasant. Then your body generates a chemical reaction that every living creature has to protect themselves. So every animal, even down to one-cell organisms, if there's a physical threat, 
your body will take evasive action to protect themselves. And it isn't always necessary in fight or flight. That's sort of a dramatic response. <clears throat> so every day when we walk around and move around, your body's programmed to stay in a safe zone. In other words, you're not putting your hand on a hot stove. When you're sitting in a chair, you're, uncon you're unconsciously moving around to protect yourself. So, for instance, people that are paraplegic, they don't have that protective sensation, develop skin sores because they can't protect themselves. So your, your whole sensory input is designed to keep you in a safe zone. So most of the time, the pain system is working correctly. If we're thirsty, we get water. If we're hungry, we get food. If it's too bright or too hot, we go inside. So your body is unconscious. How we survive and how we evolve is by staying out of danger. Humans have a major problem is that we have consciousness. So it turns out the neuroscience research shows us that consciousness or thoughts have the same reaction on the body as a physical threat. So in other words, if you have a boss just yelled at you or somebody cut you off in traffic, you weren't physically harmed, but your brain says danger, and whether it's real danger or perceived danger, it doesn't matter. So you still get that chemical response. Then you have the uncomfortable sensation that protects you, and we call that anxiety. It turns out that anxiety is simply not primarily a psychological issue. It's this massive survival reflex that protects you from danger. So what happens with humans, we can't escape our thoughts. And so we have this actually this endless barrage of unpleasant, rep unpleasant repetitive thoughts that gets worse as you get older. So what actually is the basis for chronic pain is actually the mental pain. And it's a huge problem. That's fascinating. So what's the difference between chronic pain and just the pain response you were describing to us? So there's acute pain and chronic pain. <clears throat> so again, the pain system is designed to protect you. So again, something too sharp, too dull, whatever, you simply take immediate protective action and you're protected. So that's when the pain system is functioning normally. Then you have an injury that maybe goes on for a few weeks before it heals. Again, once the healing occurs, the pain disappears. If the pain starts persisting beyond six weeks, which is a reasonable healing time, what happens is like an athlete learning a skill or a musician or an artist, you're firing these pain, pain impulses to the nervous system, and your brain starts getting first sensitized to the pain, then it starts memorizing the pain. And just like riding a bicycle, those are permanent pathways. The problem with the pain impulses compared to, say, a baseball pitcher learning how to throw a fastball or curveballs, which is almost superhuman what they do, that takes a lifetime of repetitions to keep that going. Chronic pain pathways come in, chronic pain impulses come in very, very quickly. So we've now documented that within six to 12 months that that's the time period that these pain circuits become memorized. So we're responding to a circuit and no longer the actual stimulus? Well, it's even worse than that. I mean, literally, it's uh, how what would be a good analogy. I mean, the switch is stuck on. It's short-circuited. So what happens is that they find out in, within 6 to 12 months, they've done experiments that's showing within 6 to 12 months that, the, say, for instance, let, let's take back pain, just for a common example, is that there's a certain part of the brain, which is a pain center that lights up when you hurt your back. But if it persists after six months, it switches from the pain center to the emotional center. So in other words, you have the same pain, but a different driver. So you have the switch is basically stuck on. And of course, a classic example that is was is well known as phantom limb pain. So you have a limb that's completely gone, arm or a leg. You know it's gone. We know where the source of the pain started from. Because we, when you require an amputation, you usually have some type of blood supply problem, which is very painful. So when the leg's amputated, why over 90% of people have phantom sensations. About half of the people feel the exact same limb that they had before the amputation, and they feel the same pain. But it's worse because what do you do? You can't rub it, right? You can't touch it or distract it or massage it because it's gone. So the phantom limb pain is really a big problem for the people that are experiencing it. It is horrible. And so ever since I've been in, in North Peak Surgery as a young resident, I've always been fascinated by that. Because that's never really been explained very well, you know, in our teaching and training. Why does that happen? Well, the key issue is here is that um, we now know through neuroscience research that those switches are simply stuck on. We can actually see the brain activity that, that persists. So does that happen as a result of the uh, when the emotions get involved? 
Well, we're not sure on a given person. So I want to make a <clears throat> funny hypothesis. I want to jump back into the mental pain part of it, which I think is the bigger problem. So remember, they found out that social isolation or mental pain, for instance, if you say something unkind to me, I might say you hurt my feelings, right? That's a painful statement. So it finds out that social pain or mental pain goes to the same part of the brain, whether it's physical or mental. So all of us have these unpleasant repetitive thoughts. That's what the research term is for these unpleasant repetitive thoughts, is called URTs, that we can't escape. So if you experience them, they get stronger with repetition. If you suppress them, it's even worse. It's been well documented. And then what we do mostly is we mask them. So my personal one that's a problem is if surgeons, a major spine surgeon, is suppressing, and I was a master suppressing any negative emotions at all until I couldn't. So I went from literally not having any anxiety until about age 38 to having panic attacks within two weeks. So even though I was able to successfully consciously suppress anxiety, my attitude was bring it on, all of a sudden I broke out in a panic attack, which is pretty dramatic. Well, we're going to have to address panic attacks on the other side of a short commercial break. It is time for a break, and Dr. Hanscom and I will return shortly, so don't go away. You're listening to the Mission Evolution Radio Show. We're coming to you on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on TV plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. We live in rapidly shifting times of extreme volatility and uncertainty. Such profound change brings a unique opportunity for the evolution of consciousness. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio Show, a program that explores the latest scientific developments and deepening spiritual truths supporting human evolution. Join me on xzbn.net, where I interview leading experts in science, physics, medicine, spirituality, and more. By applying divergent viewpoints to leading-edge topics, we uncover expansive and evolutionary truth to assist you on your path to enlightenment. More information and past episodes are available at missionevolution.org.
welcome back. This is Mission Evolution Radio Show, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. To stay abreast of all the wonderful information and tools we have to offer, visit our website, missionevolution.org. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka, and our very special guest this hour is Dr. David Hanscom. His website, backandcontrol.com. Dr. Hanscom, we were just getting into talking about the um, uh, anxiety factor that then starts to accompany this trapped feeling we have because we're caught in a loop of uh, our neurological pathways in regards to pain. Right. Well, you, we, we talked about yesterday a little bit before the show about this whole evolution of human consciousness. And I honestly think this is the next stage of, of evolution is that we have to figure out at a societal level this anxiety problem because we have the answer. The neuroscience research is flat out giving us the answer to the problem is that anxiety is a massive survival response that's a million times stronger than the conscious brain. In, in the history of evolution, human consciousness started just about 70,000 years ago with the cognitive revolution. Evolution. So when the cognitive revolution occurred, why well, we developed language and consciousness, and then we proceeded to conquer the earth, basically. So the next stage of it are animal brains, the unconscious brain, survival brain, is designed only to survive. It's not designed to have a good time. And if you look at human existence of millions of years, and the fact that only 70,000 years is involved with language and consciousness, it's a huge mismatch. What's happening right now is that the medical world is treating anxiety as a psychological issue. So you're using rational means to deal with these irrational, unconscious survival circuits. It's like trying to stop a dragster with handbrakes on a bicycle. You can't do it. This is not a fair battle. So I went through this battle myself for literally over 15 years, probably longer if you look at the whole picture. And I went to counseling extensively, which I'm an advocate of counseling, by the way. It just has a specific place in the whole process. But it turns out that the more you discuss your pain or anxiety, you're actually reinforcing the response. So the definition so of chronic pain— Excuse me. Is that because you're reinforcing the uh, neurological pathways in the brain? Right. You're, uh-huh. you're talking about your troubles. You're talking about your past. And remember, this very second, every response your brain automatically picks to the current moment is based on your past experiences, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Language, who you like, who you dislike, you know, people in your past that you like, similar people now are your friends, people in the past that you dislike, people like that now you dislike now, certain attitudes, belief systems, etc., are all based on your past experience. So the brain is automatically picking past experiences, again, to stay alive with programming. And for staying alive, my friend Dr. Luskin out of Stanford, who wrote the book Forgive for Good, pointed out really clearly that the human organism is designed for one purpose, and that's to survive, right? That's it. It's not intended to have a good time. So all your physiological responses are survival responses. There's not anything about your survival responses that are intended to have a good time. Now, consciousness is interesting because animals play, humans play. So the creatures that were the most social that could get along with other creatures would have had a higher chance of surviving. So there's no question consciousness is a huge factor. It's what makes us human, but also even animals play. So there's a part of our brain that's very social. And again, that's a survival skill, Right. But the problem is with humans, with the language issue, is that animals play, they interact, they read social cues, and the ones that do it the best survive. Humans, same thing. Unfortunately with humans is that it's the most anxious species that survive because if you didn't pay attention to your cues, social or physical, you didn't survive or didn't thrive. So we're selected out as a group this generation of the most anxious creatures in the entire existence of humanity because the most anxious are the ones who survived. So to get to the next stage of evolution, you have to understand the survival response, understand you're not going to solve anxiety. In fact, you don't want to solve anxiety. You learn to live with it. You learn to be aware of it, and you learn to not overreact to it. You learn to train your body to have less of a reaction to a threat, you start learning through what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, but the cognitive distortions that create unnecessary anxiety. And you start becoming aware of these cognitive distortions, the anxiety starts to drop down. But remember, anxiety is only that sensation 
generated by this neural chemical response to the environment. So as you decrease this chemistry, decrease the histamines, cortisol, and adrenaline, simply calming down those chemicals decreases anxiety. If you want to try and talk about it, analyze it, fix it, you're actually making it way worse. What you resist persists kind of thing. Correct. So if you want to do battle with these circuits, which we all do, again, I spent 15 years in chronic pain. This is no joke. So the thing that's also ironic is that I know I'm not getting to see this much more clearly the last five years. <clears throat> We're dealing with a lot of family issues, but everybody has anxiety. Everybody does. And we look at the next person who looks calm, cool, and collected, which is also a survival trait because if you look anxious and vulnerable, you're more subject to attack, right? So as a human race, we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to look, put together, knowledgeable, suave, suave, whatever you want to call it. We put on this persona of being together. And so um, it's, uh, it's a problem because we spend so much energy trying not to be anxious, we actually end up firing up those circuits. It's a big problem. So we're stressing ourselves over not being stressed. Right, exactly. So, so if everybody just dropped their sword and said, look, I mean, I'm anxious, you're anxious, and not necessarily wallow in it, but again, it's so, I mean, one of the ways we cover up anxiety, by the way, is becoming angry. In other words, anxiety represents being vulnerable. Since it's, since it's a survival reaction, we'll do anything to avoid feeling vulnerable, right? That's the deepest factor and sensation we want to avoid because nobody likes feeling vulnerable. So one of the ways you solve that is you become angry. Remember, anger is a very powerful feeling. But at the same time that anger covers up the feeling of anxiety, it actually cranks up the body chemistry and actually makes it worse. So while you're actually angry, you feel in charge and control. And my cover up in retrospect, which I'm really not very happy about, is I was a perfectionist, which means I was always angry at myself. I was never good enough. So that covered up anxiety pretty darn well, but at the same time made it much worse. And they suppressed the anxiety to all of a sudden, bam, I went to a panic attack. I literally went from zero anxiety to panic attacks in about two weeks. It was brutal. It was really brutal. So what's what's the uh, chemistry behind panic attacks? So you just so that is a fight or flight response. So when I say that in general, your body gives you chemical reactions all day long that guide your behavior in a very I guess the word functional way. So you have a little bit of adrenaline, you calm it down, you you just stay within the zone. So if somebody really threatens you either physically or socially, your, your heart starts to raise. So that is a fight or flight response. So what happens a panic attack is a true, true, deep, severe fight or flight response. So you get this massive adrenaline surge out of nowhere. It becomes somewhat predictable what sets it off is all it happened to me on a about 10 o'clock at night driving onto a bridge on a freeway is fairly typical for them to begin on a freeway at night because obviously sensory input is not quite the same. And I was driving across Lake Washington about 10 o'clock at night. Also, my heart started to race. My started to sweat. I got a little bit dizzy and faint. I'm driving 60 miles an hour on a bridge and I thought I was going to die. So it's this massive adrenaline surge that gives you a racing heart, you're, you're racing, you breathe fast, your skin sweats, your muscles tighten up, and it's just a true fight or flight response. So can this be, um, you kind of alluded to that, uh, you, you know, panic attacks coming out of nowhere can be uh, brought on by uh, stuffing or masking your normal uh, fight or flight response. Um, do you start building up body, I mean, chemistry that then just kind of goes on, on off crazy or what? Well, that's correct. I mean, I, when I look back on my life and time in general, so other symptoms that occur with an adrenalized nervous system are, there's over 30 of them, 30 of them. So migraine headaches are one of them. I had migraines since I was five years old. Ringing in the ears or tinnitus is another one. Um, irritable bowel, spastic bladder, which I didn't have, but those are again, irritable bowel syndrome actually is one of the symptoms because what happens is, is that the adrenaline shuts down the blood supply to the stomach in the bladder. Mm -hmm. So I had 16 of these 30 symptoms at the same time. And then we added on panic attacks on top of it. It was brutal. See, I had all these symptoms occurred, but I didn't know what they were. 
I just, you know, sort of blew them off. I get migraine headaches, big deal. But I was tough. I mean, I was really, really tough. And I was sort of legendary for being cool under pressure. That was my own, that's one of the identities I took on. And it doesn't work. It works for a while, but right now the burnout rate in medicine is over 60%. And it's essentially due to suppressed anxiety because we're the healers. We're not really given the bandwidth to be anxious because our patients don't want us to be anxious. So guess what? We take that role on and we're the ultimate suppressors, particularly spine surgeons. Well, you know, this this would also apply to police officers, to soldiers, right. to emergency yep. workers. You have to right. shut down and be grounded and put your stuff aside, but right. then you pay the cost on the other side, it sounds like. Right. So what's ironic is that we teach mindfulness-based surgery to our fellows, <clears throat> which means you acknowledge your anxiety and you become now connected to the move. So what happens is that ironically that by becoming aware of the anxiety, you quit fighting it. So you have way more energy to actually focus on the moves. So my complication rates probably dropped at least 80%. My fellows go out trained with a fraction of the complications I had in my first five years in practice. Well, we're, so we're paradox- going, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to pick up on how to deal with anxiety on the other side of yet another short pause. Dr. Hanscom and I will return to our discussion on the other side of this break. So you stay right there. This is Mission Evolution Radio Show. We're coming to you on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond, you're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network www.xzbn.net ABS Media You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well it is, but you can have it today right now. It is Simo TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi, you can still listen to the X Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X Minus One, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, After the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. 
For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back. This is the Mission Evolution Radio Show, bringing leading-edge information, supporting the path to unity and enlightenment. Don't miss all the wonderful things we have to offer on your, our website, missionevolution.org. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka, and we're speaking with Dr. David Hanscom, his website, backandcontrol.com. Dr. Hanscom, it would appear to me from our conversation so far that when we're, you know, uh, subject to panic attacks, when we have our neurological pathways um, cluttered up with uh, uh, pain messages and fight or flight um, responses, that we can't really evolve to our potential. How do we work beyond that? Well, again, you're dealing with the unconscious brain, so you actually have to tap into the unconscious to solve the problem. So what doesn't work is to analyze the past and try to fix the past. And I tell my patients pretty much every day, if you want to analyze and fix the past, you must have put your hand right into a hornet's nest, right? Because all the stuff that's making you a little bit crazy now, you're simply stirring up the nest and you're keeping it going. So I wrote a website post called Solving the Unsolvable, is that once you realize that these massive survival patterns are not solvable, anxiety and anger are necessary, the essence of mental health is actually being comfortable with comfortable feelings. And again, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the mental pain rather than the physical pain. Because I've also found out when I give my patients a choice of getting rid of their physical pain versus their mental pain, people don't like anxiety. They can sort of deal with the pain at some level. And same thing with me. My knees are hurting these days from arthritis but it's just pain. When it was layered with this crippling anxiety, which I had for about 15 years, with the last seven being absolutely intolerable, that relentless anxiety just drives you right into the ground. That's the part that allows you, it just sucks the life right out of you. And you're right, you can't move on to a different life. So what you have to do, there's three steps to doing this. Actually, there's two basic concepts. One is decreasing the body's stress chemicals. That's where mindfulness and meditation come into play. And then, the neuroplasticity, which is changing the shape of your brain, is that you have stress, automatic survival response. So that's what the brain is supposed to do. So what you do, you create an awareness of the stress and a, an and awareness of your reaction. So you create in, in that space of awareness, you create a little bit of a space that you now substitute and redirect. I call it reprogramming. So instead of having that automatic survival response, which is adrenaline, which creates anxiety, and create a little bit of a space, and then you realize unconsciously that this reaction is not really helping your quality of life, then you take a deep breath and redirect. So there's lots of ways of doing that, lots of ways of letting go, but it's creating that little bit of a space based on awareness that, that that's the beginning of the process. So, so that so, space that you're creating is like a break in that uh, squirrel wheel, if you will. Right. That vicious cycle. Right. But my, in my story, I mean, literally, I went for 38 years. I didn't know I was anxious. Honestly, I was not connected to anxiety. Then I also didn't know I was angry. In fact, I thought I was really sort of cold. It turns out that it was none of the above, that I had incredible anger from an abusive background, but I suppressed that also. So my manifestation of that was always being, quote, frustrated, which is a disguise for anger, being very judgmental of myself and other people, which is another form of anger. So I disguised my anger and anxiety so well that I wasn't connected to it. So you have to be aware that you're anxious and angry first. The people that don't, that don't do well with the doc project are the ones that say, I have zero anxiety, zero anger, and there's actually nothing I can do. I swear, I've actually never broken through when people come in and say, look, I'm not anxious, I'm fine. And even worse, they say, well, I'm not angry, I'm fine. So I'll ask them, well, what about the pain? Are you happy about the pain? Well, no, I'm not happy about the pain. <clears throat> I go, well, there you go. So people don't like to be anxious. They don't like to be angry. It's part of their self-image that they don't really care to go to. And it's humbling. If you want to use the word humbling. But at the end of the day, you, you end up essentially completely killing your ego, which is a huge relief, by the way. And then all these things that used to sort of torture you with these responses just aren't a big issue anymore. So as you start training your brain to not be as reactive, you're having less adrenaline. Again, anxiety is the adrenaline. 
Remember, anxiety actually is the pain. Whether it's mental pain or physical pain, you develop this uncomfortable feeling that we call anxiety. So anxiety actually is the pain. So by decreasing the body's chemistry, all of a sudden you start having some space to actually now become creative. And I think you might see my website post going from reactive to, to creative. So when you're reacting, you're trying to survive, right? So if, if you are reacting, you simply cannot be creative. To evolve to the next stage of human evolution, it's gonna, it's gonna take creativity, right? So when you're triggered and angry, all the intellectual words like compassion and love disappear. I mean, that trigger just wipes everything else out. doesn't matter how devoted and committed you are to good deeds, etc. When you're triggered, the compassion goes out the window. So the way to elicit compassion is actually detonating the trigger so it doesn't cover up the com compassion part of your life. So the idea is that you, as you just start, start treating your brain with repetition, so you're reacting. So you take the letter C out of the word reactive and place it at the beginning of the word. You have the word creative. So if you can see first, in other words, create that space, then you can become creative. How much does our media, and I mean, we're being bombarded all the time with true information, misinformation, all of it, a lot of it, you know, traumatic and, and um, demanding and nonstop. How much is this playing into this uh, vicious cycle? Oh, it's huge. It's terrible. So one of the things I, actually, actually, I ask my patients to do now, for some reason, I wrote a website post called Taking on the World's Suffering. Remember I said that the victim role or being angry is a very powerful role and powerful feeling. So the biggest obstacle, by the way, to solving chronic pain is, is that people actually don't want to give it up. They become addicted to their pain. So one of the ways that plays out is simply watching the news. In other words, you get, you're sitting in front of the TV. You get really upset about things on TV that you have no control over. So paradoxically, you now adrenalize your nervous system. You've made your pain worse. You have less capacity to go out into the world and actually help your family and friends and society. So one of the homework assignments I give my patients now is simply don't watch the news at all. I'm also surprised how many people in pain actually watch the news all the time. Is And I used, I used to be one of those people, and I get it. I'm also one of those people that I don't like, you know, human trafficking. I don't like world hunger. I don't like a lot of the ISIS type politics, obviously, human trafficking. But there's nothing I can do. And I don't have to accept it. But I don't have to. And I used to be one of those people who was always on fire about all sorts of political issues. But the problem is it burns you out. I talked to a group back east and found out that the burnout rate in activists is about is about 87%. So if you're constantly agitated and angry, you you paradoxically paradoxically become much less effective at actually doing what you need to do. So it's backwards in that by letting go of things that you can't control, you have much more energy to actually go out and help contribute to the solution. And enough creativity to come up with creative solutions. Right. Go out and read to kids, go visit some older people, try to organize things that for the community that are helpful and creative. There's a ton of things you can do to give back. But you but again, if you're going back to your original comment at the beginning of the show, if you're anxious and angry and frustrated and doing battle with these monstrous circuits, you, you don't have the energy to do that. You don't even, you don't even have the creativity to do that. I mean, aren't you just kind of stuck in the circuits and you can't access anything else? Right. And I call that, I actually call that phantom brain pain. So if you have these obsessive circuits in your brain going over and over and over again, it's actually the same as phantom limb pain, right? You feel, you still feel the arm or the leg, or let's take body image disorders, for instance, it's the same thing. You get stuck in something on your body that you don't like, and your brain starts spinning away, or maybe you hate the neighbor, your brain starts spinning away. And what happens, those circuits become embedded the same way as phantom limb pain does. So I call it phantom brain pain. So one of the symptoms of an adrenalized nervous system and chronic pain are obsessive thought patterns. So and, can these can these thought patterns mm -hmm. and these these neurological ruts actually recreate the pain after the pain has been gone? Well they do. That's the whole point. Again, let's go back to the stick, stick with the concept that mental pain actually is the problem. I mean, essentially, I, honestly, I give my patients a choice. If I can surgically get rid of your leg pain and you're living with the same anxiety you're living with right now, 
or you could get rid of your anxiety and deal with the pain, 90% of people really cannot handle the idea of living the rest of, rest of their life that, in that degree of anxiety. So the anxiety really is the underlying problem behind chronic pain. Well, I think it is the chronic pain. Wow. Wow. And yet everything we do in our world creates anxiety, it seems like at this point. Right. But I also think that's the part that's so paradoxical and so frustrating is that it, we just got, we don't want to be anxious, so we cover it up with anger. And remember, the antidote to anxiety is control. When you lose control of the situation, you actually kick in more chemistry and you become angry. So it turns out that anger and anxiety are exactly the same thing. But none of us want to give up that victim role. So that's where from a societal level, as far as evolution, is that our society is very angry and reactive right now. It, anger is only destructive. Nothing really gets solved in anger. And if you look at our society in almost every arena right now, we're just doing lots of anger reactive activities, which is a big problem. So the solution actually isn't, quote, squashing anger. It's actually not squashing anxiety. And it's actually not trying to solve it. It's actually understanding this is part of life. And as you learn to live with it, it doesn't run the show anymore. So the other problem is we live 30 years longer now than we did in 1950. The average lifespan in 1950 was only 47 years old. So we also have another 30 years for these circuits to keep spinning away. So it's actually one of the problems of modern existence is that we have another 30 years for these circuits to mature. Well, we're going to have to pick up on maturing circuits on the other side of a break. Uh, we do need to make take another commercial pause. So Dr. Hanscom and I will be back shortly. Don't leave us now. This is Mission Evolution Radio Show on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Exposé Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. The concept of a new age has been around since the late 19th century, yet much of its original meaning has been lost. What exactly is the new age? Is it a religion, a collection of obscure esoteric practices, a series of doomsday predictions, or an astrological event? The New Age Chronicles is a unique, complimentary publication bringing reason and grounded information to separate fact from fiction. 
chock full of valuable information to support you as we make the monumental shift into the new era. You won't want to miss a single innovative issue. The New Age Chronicles newspaper is coming soon to www.newagechronicles.com. Welcome back. This is the Mission Evolution Radio Show, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiyaka. I always love to hear from my listeners. Email me at info at missionevolution.org and suggest a topic or guest that's on your mind. I'm sure we'll all enjoy them. Our guest this hour is Dr. David Hanscom. His website, backincontrol.com. Um, I'd like to change gears just a little bit, Dr. Hanscom, and uh, it seems like we ha- we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic, if you will. What's right. the relationship between chronic pain and the opioid epidemic? Well, it's one of my most difficult topics to discuss. I may be the number one surgeon in the country who has the highest percent of my surgical practice dealing with um, people with drug addiction issues, mm-hmm. and it's a really complicated problem, but... What happens, the reason why I do so much surgery on people with drug addiction problems is that people use IV drugs, and then the bacteria, with their dirty needles, the bacteria gets into the bloodstream, it lodges in their spine and starts to grow. And mm. what happens is it starts to destroy the spine, they have to surgically take care of them. So then the hospital with a major operation, six weeks of IV antibiotics, so I've gotten to know these people really, really well, almost every time. And a lot of things have happened to them. First of all, <clears throat> their doctors gave them drugs. Then now the world says stop. So they're not going to stop the drugs. They're, they're going to simply go to the street. And it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're wealthy, off the street, it doesn't really matter. People are going to get their drugs because that's what they need. They're not going to just stop the drugs. So they so they do go to the streets. That's a big problem. Second of all, we're, we're forgetting that we're simply fighting the wrong battle against opioids. The problem that we're fighting is, is that 87% of people on opioids have chronic pain. So the solution to the opioid epidemic is not restricting access. It's actually solving chronic pain. It turns out that chronic pain is solvable, and that's what the book and website is all about. It's about a 90% self-directed process. So from a public health standpoint, the DOC process has massive public health implications because it's so self-directed. It takes very few medical interventions. The medical profession becomes more or less a guide, coach, and cheerleader as opposed to fixing you. And it's very consistent. People that get onto the process do really, really well. That includes drug addiction. So once people come out of chronic pain, they don't need the drugs. They don't want the drugs. Nobody likes being a drug addict. People forget that. You you don't become a drug addict by choice. People lost their lives, their houses, their homes, their family, everything that's good in life, they've lost. So you don't do that by choice. That is a problem with this massive survival response of unrelenting anxiety. So the battle that needs to be fought is actually against the mental pain, solving mental chronic pain. And again, I really do say mental and physical in the same sentence because they're both a problem. But again, the same part of the brain is being activated. But I've had people on hundreds and hundreds of milligrams of oxycodone and morphine a day come off all medications, no pain, full function, and back into society. That happens all the time. But I do it backwards, so I don't start with winning medications first because that increases anxiety, which increases everything. So what we do, we calm down the nervous system, reroute the pathways, better sleep, etc. cetera. So pain starts to drop, then the side effects start kicking into gear, and people simply want to come off the drugs. So I admit, I, very few people, the only reason they want to stay on the drugs because it's very anxiety-producing to come off of them, but once the pain drops, I mean, people almost universally really want off the drugs. They, nobody likes being dependent on drugs. How does how does that dependency start? Is it just like everything we've been talking about? Um, does the drug block anxiety, and we become addicted to that, or how does the anxi- how does the addiction start? Because you're saying you can get off of it. Well, yeah. Again, if you look at anxiety as a unconscious survival reflex in common on the nervous system. Remember, as you decrease the, decrease the adrenaline, you decrease the anxiety, right? So again, it's the mental pain people are actually trying to cover up with the drugs, and it works. 
So you take the narcotics, it actually works really well on mental, it works well in pain, mental or physical. So short term, it works quite well. And then the body starts getting sensitized. We call it upregulation, where the brain starts becoming inflamed. So you build up a tolerance and you start sensitizing the nervous system. And it's a big problem. So from a moral standpoint, I was part of the group of doctors in the 90s who actually put people on narcotics because they seemed to work short term. Uh, I never got into the super high dose stuff, but people, I've had people on 1,800 milligrams of oxycodone a day come off all the drugs as the pain drops. But the key issue here is that the drugs do solve mental pain short term. So they they solve mental pain short term, which mm-hmm. solves anxiety, which is right. pretty attractive um, right. if you're if you're caught in that loop. Well, it's irresistible. Remember, one of the problems you get into chronic pain is suicide. Mm. And so, I mean, I would tell you, you you know, from our prior conversations, that I was actively suicidal. Again, I was in chronic pain for 15 years, and if you told, and again, it was the anxiety that was crippling beyond words. I mean, I, I use the word like a branding iron on my brain. And so if you told me I'd live the rest of my existence in that state of mind, I go, fine, I'm out of here. And I still believe it. It it makes no sense to wake up every morning and have that degree of anxiety or mental pain. It's unbelievable. It's it's indescribable. That's why my book, I call it The Abyss, because when I try to get people to put it into words, including myself, I can't put it into words how miserable this is, being socially isolated, in pain, and, and no hope. It's unbelievably dark. It's the darkest place in this human existence. It's indescribable. So the addiction to the opioids is um, uh, physical, obviously, but it's also this um, avoidance of that horrible anxiety. I mean, I know what's the anxiety people feel when they're afraid they're going to run out of drugs and not be able to get any more. Is that really anxiety over the drugs or is that all this backed up anxiety they haven't been processing because they're on the drugs? Well, I can uh, – I'm going to – if you don't mind, correct you just a little bit. <clears throat> so you can't process anxiety because, again, it's always there every second. So it's a matter of um, learning to live with it. And it's a learned skill. With repetition, you start becoming less adrenalized. Remember, anxiety is simply the adrenaline. So the anxiety is already there. In other words, you're already over the top. Then you add on, again, another stress, which is lack of medications. It just piles onto the same process. In other words, people are on drugs in the first place because of the anxiety, either mental created either by physical or mental threats and then you simply add another stressor on which is a which is a big one and then you just made the, you just magnified the problem so it goes back into the chemistry of the whole thing right so when i again when i was doing chronic pain work on my own when i was a primary care <clears throat> for four years i did this on my own i i didn't have any resources in sun valley idaho where i was working um what happened is that i would the medication were last i would come in and work on sleep then we were working on these simple writing relaxation exercises. And, and again, I didn't know anything back then compared to what I know now. But in retrospect, it was working because sleep's a big deal. And we would work on physical conditioning, the stress management. I would keep the medications exactly the same. Then we were actually worked on life outlook of anger and anger processing and forgiveness. And people would start to come off the drugs. So the medications – so in my last 15 years, I've never done battle with a patient on drugs because they just – we just simply have part of the deal. If they don't want to participate in the process, then I'm not, I'm not the doctor. In other words, if they don't want to go through the tools that are going to decrease their anxiety, one, just the drugs, that's not going to work. So inevitably, as they went through the process, the pain would start to drop. The only, In my mind, the only bad prognostic factor of curing chronic pain is simply your willingness to engage. Once people start going into the process, the brain changes. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. You know, what social transformation or evolution do you see possible as a result of changing our relationship to pain on a large scale? So I see creativity coming back where people are spending. It's fascinating when you get people in a group, people want to make the world better almost universally. Obviously, some people don't. But what happens is that when you quit fighting this anxiety, putting that creative energy together as a society would be unbelievable. I mean, it really would transform the world in, in a massive way. But right now, we don't have the bandwidth to do it. We're you know, fighting with our family, with our kids, with chronic pain, with society. And we're getting overwhelmed with social media, et cetera. So, yeah, until we actually get this anxiety slash anger problem solved, we're not going to evolve. In fact, I think some people think maybe we're devolving a bit here the last you know, 15 years. 
what will it take to bring these concepts mainstream so they can start to have an effect? Well, I'm just going to say this tongue in cheek. I'm going to say my book, but only because my book represents a set of concepts. It's just a book. There's lots of people doing this in in their own style. So there's a universal energy right now that's out there espousing the exact same thing I'm doing in their own styles. And everybody I talk to with their own styles is having the same successes that I'm seeing. So I say, look, my book's just a book. It's a framework that will organize your own thinking. But we really need the medical profession in general to look at anxiety differently. So we, we're kind of attacking it backwards from what we've discussed here this past hour is like the way we deal with drug rehab is by removing the drug and focusing right. on the drug. The way right. we deal with anxiety is talking about anxiety and creating more anxiety. Right. So a reverse approach is necessary. Is that correct? Right. I mean, I tell my patients right off the get go when they come to my seminars, they say, look, you're not here to get rid of your pain. That's not the goal. The goal is to live your life with or without the pain. And then the pain quits running the show. If pain's running your life, your life is not a very productive life. So the key is as you de energize the pain circuits, paradoxically, the pain really does go away, but you're not going to get rid of the pain by trying to get rid of it. Fantastic. Well, as always, when I talk to you, Dr. Hanscom, time has flown, but we're out of it. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Our guest this hour has been board-certified orthopedic surgeon and developer of DOC, Direct Your Own Care Project, Dr. Hanscom. His book, Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. You can find him and many other resources he offers on his website, backincontrol.com. Remember to join our email family to stay abreast of all the exciting new things we have coming up at missionevolution.org. This has been Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiecka on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. Join us next time as the mission continues, bringing information, resources, and support to an evolving world. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. 
You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.